Hi, welcome. This is the chapter six video review, and we're looking at cell membranes. So you might think of a plasma membrane or a cell membrane as a pretty straightforward idea, but it's such an important part of the cell that we have an entire chapter to look at it more closely. All right, when we, when we talk about plasma membranes, we consider this idea of the fluid mosaic model. And what that means is that the cell membrane is both fluid, which means it has movement, and flexibility, so it's fluid, and it's also mosaic, which means it's made up of lots of different parts. Okay, so it's a mosaic as well. Just like a picture is made up of lots of parts, a mosaic, and the water is fluid. Now if you look at an actual plasma membrane, we see that we can see this fluid mosaic concept. So here's a plasma membrane picture, and with inside of it, there are lots of components, right? That's the mosaic part. There's proteins, the little yellow is cholesterol, there's phospholipids, and it's flexible. So you can see in this diagram, there's some movement across the membrane. So it's both a fluid and a mosaic. Right? Of course, just to remind you, we're talking about the plasma membranes are a phospholipid bilayer, so it's literally two layers of these phospholipids. Remember, the interior is hydrophobic. That's where the fatty acid tails are. They're hydrophobic, means water-fearing. And then the top part is the hydrophilic region. So that gives unique chemistry to the plasma membrane. And as a result, we have what's called selective permeability. So only certain substances will pass through. So this membrane's selective in what it allows to pass through, and it's based on the chemistry inside the plasma membrane and the chemistry of the molecules trying to pass through. All right. We're going to be talking about different types of transportation of substances across the plasma membrane. And essentially, we have two types of transportation, passive transport and active transport. The first type we'll look at is passive transport. And passive means without using energy. Okay, So when we think of passive transport, you want to think of two things. Does not require energy. And second, it goes with the concentration gradient. So what that means, it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. So you can think of this ball moving down this hill. The ball naturally rolls down a hill without you having to keep pushing it. Gravity will pull it down all by itself. And this is the concentration gradient from a high region to a low region. So we have three types of passive transport, diffusion, osmosis, and then we have facilitated diffusion, which just means diffusion that's aided by other um, molecules, uh, channel proteins or carrier proteins. Now diffusion is the simplest one. And if you think about an example of um, if somebody has a cup of coffee in a room, eventually that whole room, you'll be able to smell it. So those little particles of the coffee, the smell is going to diffuse across the whole classroom and it's going to go from an area where it's high concentration, where the cup is itself, and it's going to diffuse across the classroom. Okay, here's the example from class. If you put drops of color in a beaker, eventually those colors will go from where they're in high concentration to where they're low, and they'll continue to mix within that beaker until they get to a state of equilibrium. Okay, this um, beaker on the right there. So it's a pretty simple concept, but you want to remember no energy is required, and you have a movement from a high concentration to a low concentration. So the red is going to move towards the right where it's in low concentration, and the blue is going to move towards the left, and the green is going to go in both directions. So you look, we get a complete mix or equilibrium of the components. Now osmosis is also a type of passive transport, and this has to do with the diffusion of water across a um, permeable membrane. Okay, so water across a permeable membrane, so maybe the plasma membrane, for instance. And essentially, what's happening is the water is going to go from areas where it's in high concentration, or it's more pure, to regions where the water is in a lower concentration. So one way I like to think of this is water diffuses from where it's pure to less pure. Okay, pure to less pure. So let's look at some examples. Okay, we have three types of solutions when we're talking about osmosis, hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. Hypertonic, the first one here, means there's more stuff dissolved outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell. All right, so if you look at this, on the left, this is inside the cell. On the right, this is outside the cell. You see all this stuff dissolved there. So the water is more pure inside the cell, less pure outside the cell. And we say water goes from pure to less pure, so it's going to move out of the cell. And net movement of water outside of the cell, the water loses cell, so it shrivels up. Okay, this is a red blood cell shriveled up. In the center, that's what a red blood cell should look like. So that's hypertonic. I remember hyper because there's lots of stuff dissolved outside the cell. 
it's kind of active outside the cell, it's very hyper. Isotonic means there's the equal amount of stuff dissolved inside the cell and outside of the cell, and so there's no net change in volume, okay? The water is moving both back and forth the same, so the cells maintain their uh, shape. The last one, hypotonic, there's more stuff dissolved inside the cell than outside of the cell, and so water goes from where it's more pure outside to inside, and so the cells swell up and they eventually lice and break open. Hypo, I think of hippo, so the cells actually swell and get big, maybe like a hippo. Now the other thing, what are the, these substances? Inside the cell, there's lots of substances dissolved. There's ions, there's sugars, there's um, other macromolecules, and so that creates a gradient for this water to travel against. Okay, so it's very important that cells are kept in their proper environment to maintain their water balance. So for passive movement, remember we're talking no energy and the movement with the concentration gradient or from high to low, we have diffusion, okay, we have osmosis, then we have facilitated diffusion. Facilitated means to help, and when we have facilitated diffusion, there's two types of helpers. We have channel proteins and carrier proteins. So let's look at some examples of these. Channel proteins, okay, they come in two forms. Here's one, a gated channel. So what a gated channel is, is a membrane protein, a transmembrane protein. It means it spans the entire um, span of the plasma membrane, and it creates a, a, a channel. That's why it's called a channel protein. And this signal molecule, or what we call a, a stimulus or a ligand, will bind to this uh, channel protein, this gated channel, so it's closed now, the gate's closed, when the signal molecule binds, the channel opens, and these substances outside the cell can diffuse through, so they're helped um, in the fact that now they have a passage through this plasma membrane. There's no energy used, but we're just creating a channel for them to pass through. Um, a note here is that, let's imagine these substances are charged, they're polar, and so they're hydrophilic, they like water, so it's hard for them to pass through the membrane by themselves, but if you create a channel, a favorable channel, these molecules can then diffuse through, no problem. So that's why it's called facilitated diffusion. Okay, so we have gated channels. We also have ion channels. These are specialized channels, so there's proteins that create a channel in the membrane and they allow specific ions to pass through. So in this example, we can see these small little squares are potassium, they pass through, and sodium's unable to fit through this channel. So it gives a passage for potassium specifically in this case. Another type of facilitated diffusion we have um, requires a special type of membrane protein called carrier proteins. What carrier proteins are, kind of similar to the channel proteins, but they're transmembrane proteins, and in this case we're going to see glucose being transported across. So when glucose binds to this carrier protein, it actually changes shape. So right now it's kind of open towards the outside of the cell. When glucose binds, this um, carrier protein opens towards the inside of the cell. And glucose is brought in through um, diffusion. So there's no energy required. It's just re related to the fact that when glucose binds, this protein changes shape and allows the glucose to pass through. So there's carrier proteins that allow sugars to pass in and also amino acids, which are required for proteins, right? All right, so those were all passive transportation. No energy, and we went with the concentration gradient. Now we have the last part here. We'll look at some active movement, and the key with active movement is that we, um, oops, we actually do require energy, so I'll fix that, and the movement is against the concentration gradient, so you can actually go from a low concentration to a high concentration. All right, so it's kind of the opposite of the passive. So active requires energy and it can move against the concentration gradient. Okay, we have a, um, some basic types of transporters for active moon, movement. Uniport, which moves one substance in one direction. A symport, which moves two substances in one direction. And then we have an antiporter, which moves two substances in opposite directions, okay? And when it comes down to active transport or active movement, there's two main types. There's primary active, which uses energy from ATP directly, and this is the sodium potassium pump we'll see in a second. And then there's secondary active transport, which uses some other sort of gradient to transport molecules into the cell. All right, so we'll take a look at these and pull them all together. So on the left here, we have the sodium potassium pump. This is a primary transport um, 
mechanism. It's found in all animal cells. And what it does is it transports sodium and potassium. It literally is going to be pumping sodium out of the cell. And it requires ATP. This is our energy source. So here's ATP. Okay, when ATP is used, it becomes ADP. So this energy is supplied okay, by ATP. What happens is three sodiums bind to the pump. Energy from ATP pumps those sodium out. So now we've pumped out three sodiums. That's three plus charges. And then two potassiums will come back in. So we pump out three sodiums using ATP, and then we bring back in two um, potassiums. Okay, three sodium out, two potassium in. We use ATP to drive this. Now we're accumulating a positive charge outside. We're getting lots of sodiums outside. We're pumping three out for every two so um, potassiums we bring in. So this first part here, that's just the sodium potassium pump. It's primary active because it uses ATP directly. But as a consequence of this primary active transport of the sodium potassium pump, we're creating a gradient of sodium outside. So there's lots of sodium outside. It's gonna to wanna to come back in, okay? And it's gonna come in through this um, protein right here in the membrane. And so when the so sodium wants to come back in, what it's gonna do is gonna sneak a glucose in with it. So the glucose sneaks in with that sodium that's trying to come in. And this allows us to bring glucose in even if it's against the glucose concentration gradient. All right, so that's good. It helps us get a lot of sugar inside the cell so we can use it for energy. So the first part here is just the sodium potassium pump. It's a primary active transport, but the consequence of the primary active is that we create a gradient of sodium outside that can be used for the secondary active transport. So we've pumped out lots of sodium using ATP. Now the sodium wants to come back in naturally. So when the sodium moves with its concentration gradient in, it's gonna sneak some glucose in with it against the glucose concentration gradient. And we wanna get glucose in because that's our energy source, that's our fuel. All right, so really focus on this slide in your notes and um, make sure you understand the concepts of primary and secondary active transport and the sodium potassium pump. So those are good examples of how we bring in small molecules or you know, ra rather small molecules, but there's other ways things are brought into the cell. And the three major classes, apart from the transporters that we saw, are phagocytosis is a way of bringing in large materials. Pinocytosis, which is sometimes called cell sipping, is just bringing in small amounts of um, liquid and fluids sur surrounding or adjacent to the cell. And then there's a very specific type of endocytosis called receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is based on receptors on the plasma membrane that bind to a very specific uh, substance, and then it gets brought into the cell. So receptor-mediated endocytosis is very specific, um, and then phagocytosis and pinocytosis. All right, so you can look at those uh, more closely from our notes in class. And then lastly, I'll just remind you, we're talking about bringing stuff in, but sometimes we need to... Um, get rid of stuff or have things leave the cell. And this is called exocytosis, exo for exiting, cytosis meaning the cell, so we're exiting the cell. Essentially what happens, substances are packaged in vesicles. These vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and that stuff is released. Kind of what we saw with the uh, endomembrane system in the previous chapter. So you might wonder why would you do this? Well, one of the big things, you might wanna get rid of, rid of waste materials. Um, but we saw with the, tran with the endomembrane system, we'll package proteins and they'll be excreted as well through exocytosis. So these things could be enzymes or maybe neurotransmitters, uh, signal molecules, or other things that are being released um, from this cell. So that's a quick review of chapter six, the plasma membrane.